we've learned a lot over the past 10, 15 years about mountain lions in North Dakota, and I'm just here to present that information to you. There's no scary science in here. This is just the highlights, the basic information that we've learned. I don't have a bunch of methods in there. There's no statistics. Um, but if you have questions about that, don't feel like you can't ask. If you have any questions about what kind of methods we use to determine any of this information, just feel free to ask. All right, so where we started. I kind of started arbitrarily about year 2000. So that's when things really started to pick up with mountain lions in North Dakota. This here graph is our report trend for mountain lions. So the mountain lions that in the dark were the mountain lions that were verified, confirmed to be mountain lions, okay? For us to confirm it to be mountain lions, we have some pretty stringent criteria. We want a picture of the animal, a picture of its tracks, DNA evidence, things like that. So even if somebody sees one, we'll probably just count it as unverified, okay? So it would go into that unverified category. But you can see things really started to pick up in 2000. What was going on before 2000? In the 1980s, we did have a handful of verified mountain lion reports in the state. And in 1990s, we had almost one verified report every year during the 1990s, okay? So they were here in the 90s, and we were getting reports and documenting that, but things really started to heat up in 2000. What was our department working on then? We were working on some public awareness and education and a reporting system. So what we're looking at here is the data that's a result of a more formal reporting system we set up from outlines in the state and how we collected that information. And then we also developed a response plan. Okay, what is the department going to do if this or this or this happens? Okay, and then we have that available out there. And we also get, got some recommendations from the staff at that time. So the recommendations were conduct some research to find out what's going on with mountain lions, and they suggested opening a hunting season on mountain lions as a way to get our hands on some individual mountain lions and find out more about those mountain lions. And as you can see, we did do that, okay? That was the first thing we enacted. We opened a limited hunting season on mountain lions in 2005 and 6. This is all we knew about mountain lions at that time. These are all the verified reports for mountain lions in the state in 2005 when we opened the hunting season. Really, all we knew is that they were breeding in the Badlands area. We had evidence of adult females that had been reproductively active, and we had evidence of kittens that were out there, so we knew they were reproducing in the state. Okay, so that's just the extent of our knowledge at that time, and then we so slowly started creeping forward. The quota was five, and this is just kind of going to progress through the changes in the hunting season as the years went on. At the beginning, hounds were allowed from the get-go. So from the very beginning of the hunting season, you could use hounds to pursue mountain lions in North Dakota. At that time, incidentals that were killed outside of the hunting season, or for other reasons like automobile collisions or protection of property, counted against that quota too. Okay, so that was a little bit different back then. 2006-7, we changed the opening for the hound season. Okay, we pushed that hound opener actually all the way back to January 1st. Okay, so this is set up in a timeline fashion, so I'm just going to keep going through the years and tell you what we knew when. Okay, so 2006 comes along. We developed a habitat suitability model for mountain lions in North Dakota. We haven't done research on mountain lions in the state at that point in time, so what we did is mountain lions have been researched in a lot of other places, very heavily researched. So we used information collected from those other states. We said what mountain lions like. They like really rugged topography. They like trees because they need that stocking cover so they can pursue their prey. And so we put together this map. So the dark green areas show the highly suitable habitat for mountain lions that we thought at that time. Okay, so this is 2006 and that's what we thought mountain lions would like in North Dakota then. We identified two areas of the state, the Missouri River Breaks area and the Badlands region, as the only areas of highly suitable habitat that were large enough to hold a population of mountain lions. Okay, we all know one individual doesn't make a population. You need to have multiple individuals in breeding to have a population. And this is where we thought there was enough habitat to sustain that population or to have a population. And this here was the basis for how we set up our zones in North Dakota, okay? Our two hunting zones, zone one, being where we had our breeding population of mountain lions. We were more conservative with our harvest strategy there, our hunting season. And that's because that's where we were gonna try and sustain a limited number of mountain lions. Even though there are some other areas of suitable habitat in North Dakota, they weren't large enough to sustain a population. And so we have more liberal hunting seasons in actually eastern North Dakota than western North Dakota. So if a mountain lion wanders out of the Badlands, 
It's already removed itself from our breeding population, and so we're a little bit more liberal, liberal with the hunting season because of that. Okay, also in 2006, we kind of informally started some research on mountain lions. A mountain lion was incidentally captured in a foothold trap that was set for bobcats, and so we took that opportunity to put a radio collar on the mountain lion because we had one available at the time, and we started following him around. Uh, this was a male, one-year-old mountain lion at that time. We also recollared him two other times in 2008 and 2009 to keep that radio collar going after the battery started to wear down and so forth. Uh, the last known location for this particular mountain lion was actually in 2010. So its fate is unknown. We don't know what happened to this mountain lion. The radio collar could have just died or the animal could have died, but we don't know. Uh, so we informally did start following mountain lions around all the way back to 2006. Okay, so things moved along. We still had a quota of five in 2007 and eight. Now we shifted the hound hunting season again to December 1st, okay? None of the hound guys uh, had an opportunity to harvest a mountain lion in 2006-7, so we moved that hunting, hound hunting season up again, and that's when we split the state into the two zones, zone one and zone two. We also took incidentals that were killed outside of the hunting season or for other reasons, uh, instantly caught in a snare maybe perhaps, and we removed those from that quota, okay? So those would be taken outside of our hunting quota. Also in 2007, Fort Berthold opened their first hunting season on mountain lions. Fort Berthold has a hunting season on mountain lions still to this day. Uh, the quota was five for most of the years until this last year they increased their quota to 10 on Fort Berthold. So they still do have an open hunting season on Fort Berthold. It's managed separately than ours, but sort of in conjunction with ours. And most of the data from the mountain lines that are taken on Fort Berthold is included with our data set as well, okay? In 2008, we increased the quota to eight, and it stayed that way for two years. No other change. And in 2010, we increased it again to 10, 10 mountain lines. And then increased it again in 2011. So we're getting these mountain lines in. We require people to turn in the carcasses from their harvested mountain lines so we can collect information. So that's kind of all we're doing at this point in time. Okay, we're just collecting those dead mountain lines. We're collecting information from the carcasses, age, reproductive status, basic measurements, things like that. And we're just going through. In 2011 though, we split the zone one season into an early and late season. Up until this point, um, the hound hunters still weren't getting any access to our hunting quota. Usually the quota was met before the hound season opened on that December 1st date. So what we did is we split it into an early and late season and we split that quota into those two seasons. So that even if the early qu season quota was filled, there'd still be some in that late season uh, that would be available to hound hunters should they want to pursue mountain lions during that late season. It wasn't only a hound season, the late season, okay? It's not just for hound hunters. Other hunters can go after mountain lions in the late season as well. 2011, though, is when things really started to pick up with research. Like Jeb mentioned, we started phase one. This is a formal research project. Again, we're working with South Dakota State University. Dr. John Jenks is the professor in charge, and the first graduate student was named Dave Wilkins. And Dave is now graduated, but the, the objectives of his research were the survival and cause-specific mortality. Okay, what are they, how well are they doing in North Dakota? What are they dying from? And then Dave also looked at food habits. What are they eating in North Dakota? So that started, you can see here, in 2011, when that's what our hunting season looked like at that time. Okay, so I'm going to... Nothing's changed much since 2012. 2012, we upped our quota to 21. It was still split between the early and late season that hunting quota. But these are the first years where our hunting quota stopped being met. Okay, so the numbers in red in parentheses after the year is the number of mountain lions that were actually taken by hunters in those years. Okay, so that 10, 13, 12, and 14 were the numbers taken even though the quota was 21 at that time. Okay, now I'm gonna jump into our research results. Okay, what did we find out from phase one of the research? These are the causes of death for 15 of our radio collar mountain lions. You can see the majority of our mortality is from our hunting season. There is a little bit of poaching going on. We had one automobile collision and a couple depredation incidents. And when I say depredation, it's usually a landowner or rancher killing a mountain lion for protection of property purposes, protection of their livestock, okay? If we look at this a little bit closer, 
we had really good success with our hound hunters in the years of our research, phase one research. And so most of that hunting mortality is actually due to hound hunters in those years. And our annual survival for two years during phase one from our 15 radio collared mountain lions was 42% annual survival. So 42% of the population has a chance to live from one year to the next. This started to alarm us a little bit there because mountain lions, this is the, one of the lowest recorded survival rates for mountain lions ever documented. And typically for mountain lions to sustain the number you have on the landscape from one year to the next, you need about 70% annual survival, okay? And 42% was quite a bit lower than that. So that's what we found out about survival. How big an area are they using? So we looked at their home ranges. Adults averaged 80 square miles for males and 40 square miles for females. This is pretty middle of the road for mountain lions. This isn't really big or really small compared to other states. We're pretty middle of the road. But that's still pretty big areas. 40 square miles for females, 80 square miles for males. We also saw no seasonal variation in where those home ranges shifted during the year. In some states where there's a large deer migration during winter, you'll see mountain lions will shift their home ranges around and move into those areas where the deer go in the winter. We don't see that in North Dakota. We don't have a huge deer migration going on in the winter, so that's probably why we didn't see that going on. Okay, what were they eating? We found 12 species in their diet, so we were actually hiking in. Dave was hiking in on the kill sites of these mountain lions as soon as they indicated that they stopped for a certain amount of time, just a couple hours. He'd go out and check out to see if they killed something and what it was they had been eating. Okay, not surprisingly, 77% of their diet was deer. This is mountain lions have evolved to be a deer predator. That's primarily what they eat. There's the breakdown of mule deer and white-tailed deer. Mountain lions heavily overlap with mule deer in our primary mule deer range. Um, so that wasn't th that surprising that mule deer was more prevalent than white-tailed deer. But we did find some other stuff. Next in line of frequency was actually beavers and porcupines. Okay, so they are opportunistic, even though they prefer to eat deer, they're going to eat lots of other stuff. And then after that came some one bighorn sheep, coyote, elk. This case of the elk was elk calves, okay? We did not document any of the mountain lions taking adult elk. And then last but not least was a smorgasbord of other things, including cattle. We did have one of our adult male mountain lions that was killing calves. And we realized that pretty quickly after we put the radio collar on that mountain lion and we did go out and remove that mountain lion. So he was shortly in the sample. Uh, we did not have any of our other radio collar mountain lions killing any cattle, uh, but we did have that one and we removed it. You'll see down here is also mountain lions. Mountain lions do kill other mountain lions. Uh, this is typically infanticide, what we see here in North Dakota. This is adult males killing kittens uh, from, uh, from litters around them. And so they will kill them and they will even eat them. Okay, so they will kill each other. On average, they were killing one deer per week. Now, that being said, we have evidence that some of that was scavenge. Okay? These were deer that died from either hit, being hit by automobiles, being wounded by hunters. And so mountain lions, it's often thought that they need to kill their own food. They won't eat stuff that they find dead, but that's not true. They do uh, scavenge quite a bit. This isn't very high. This is a pretty low scavenge rate, 8% scavenge rate compared to some other states. While we were doing our phase one research, South Dakota State University and some other researchers down there were also looking at the genetics of mountain lions in North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. And we contributed 115 genetic samples of 115 different individuals to this research. And so you can see there that there is a clear, all this shows is the red is the South Dakota population and each line is a green individual that is from the North Dakota population. What this tells us is there's a clear distinction between North Dakota mountain lions and South Dakota lions when you look at their genetics. We're separated far enough that we're operating as two separate populations, okay? So there is a limited amount of dispersal going on. So here you can see just kind of a zoom in on some of the green lines that some of the South Dakota lions come straight up here and probably get taken, okay? So this is an individual with pretty much solid South Dakota genetics that was, was killed in North Dakota. And some lions come up and intermingle with our lions and they breed and they contribute some of their genes to the population. Okay, and they get mixed in with our genes. 
out of the 115 samples we contributed, um, four, depending on the estimator used, the analysis used, there was somewhere between four and six of those individuals were from South Dakota. Okay, so we have a very low level of dispersal coming up from South Dakota. We also know that we have a little bit of dispersal coming in from Montana as well. The Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge in Montana has a mountain lion population, and some of those individuals have come, in over, come over into North Dakota. They were not included in this analysis, so we, can't, we, don't, we don't know which of these individuals, if any of them, were from Montana. But we do have some very distinct separate genetics from South Dakota. Okay, we're up to 2014 now, start phase two of our research. Still working with South Dakota State University. Next graduate student is Randy Johnson, and Randy's actually in the room tonight up here up front, so if you have any questions about his research, feel free to hit him up at the end of tonight. Uh, Randy's objectives are similar but a little bit different. Okay, so we're still looking at survival, so we're going to continue radio collaring and monitoring mountain lions, seeing what they're dying from. But at the same time, we're going to validate some of the models we use to monitor the population. And I'm going to talk about each of these next, and I'll explain to you what we mean by validate those models. I just wanted to bring you up to speed. Now, in 2016, as of yesterday, all the verified reports and mountain lines we've had in the state. So remember when I showed you the map at the beginning, how we just had a little handful of verified reports in the state? This is the number of verified reports for mountain lines in the state since that time. Okay, so we're up to 479 verifications. You can see our stronghold is still in the Badlands area, but mountain lions have wandered out and turned up just about anywhere in the state. Okay, they're known as long distance dispersers. They will wander out there and they can turn up anywhere. But if we look a little bit more closely, this is where mountain lions have died in North Dakota. Okay, so this is where carcasses have actually turned up, where mountain lions have been harvested by hunters or taken for other reasons. Still, mostly in the Badlands, and fewer out here in the rest area of the state. And then if we zoom down a little bit further and say, what's going on with these dead mountain lions? These are all the verified mountain lions, mountain lion carcasses, the ones that we've examined, looked at, that were either reproductively active females or their kittens. So this is where the reproductive activity is going on in the state. And in that case, we're restricted to the most northern Badlands, the very extreme northern Badlands. And we only had 47 individuals that indicate reproductive activity in North Dakota. Okay, but what does this tell us compared to this habitat suitability map in the background? It tells us that we were probably a little bit off in 2006. Okay, so we're showing that mountain lions should be in the entire Badlands region and they're just not there. They're not, there's some turning up there, but they're not breeding there. And so this is part of Randy's work for phase two. What is going on there? What are we missing? And so we're going to update this habitat suitability map and get a better handle on what's really going on in North Dakota. Because obviously we're missing something here. The mountain lions like something about the northern badlands, uh, and we haven't quite got that na nailed down yet. Okay, so that area where we have the breeding range is a little over 1,000 square miles. This would be the second smallest breeding range of mountain lions in the United States. The only other smaller range would be Nebraska recently has a population that's recolonized their state, and it would be smaller than ours. Compared to something like the Florida panther, so the Florida panther is just another name for mountain lions, the Florida panther have about 10 times the breeding range that mountain lions in North Dakota do. So that gives you a little bit of comparison there. And South Dakota's got about eight times that size breeding range in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Okay, what have mountain lions died from since we started collecting the carcasses in 2005 and open the hunting season. The black bars, of course, show the hunting season. You can see, again, predominantly the known mortalities that we know about over the years have died at the hands of hunters. Uh, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. We know that the hunting season is driving our survival rate in North Dakota. We know that's what's driving the survival rate. That being said, that's something we have control over, okay? So we can adjust our hunting season uh, accordingly. If it was something else that came out, say mountain lions, the survival rate was being driven by roadkill, by automobile collisions. Well, that's really hard for us to have any control over. You know, that would just be kind of, wouldn't be able to do anything with that. So it's not a bad thing that it's the hunting season that's the number one uh, driving factor here. Okay, so we also have the blue bars, of course, protection of property and self. Most everybody in this room probably knows that if you're 
um, have livestock or pets and you find a mountain lion mauling your livestock or pets, you, in state law you can, you can shoot that mountain lion. No repercussions against you. Okay? So we do have uh, mountain lions that are killed for those reasons, for protection of property, mostly livestock. We do have some incidental trapping and snaring going on. We're a big trapping state here in North Dakota. We have a lot of fur bears, a lot of fur bears available for harvest, and we're a big trapping state, and a lot of people are taking advantage of that. Um, and when it's trapping is done with the right equipment, usually mountain lions are an issue. But some, every once in a while, we'll see a flare up of mountain lions killed in things like cable devices or so forth. Um, cable devices in North Dakota are required to be equipped with a breakaway device. And if they are legally equipped with a breakaway device in North Dakota, in most cases, those mountain lions are going to be able to break out of that, OK? So this is kind of an anomaly. It's not necessarily, you know, we have a lot of restrictions in place to try and prevent this from happening. So this isn't the norm when we see a lot of mountain lions dying in cable devices and traps. Usually something else is going on there. We have had a little bit of poaching. You can see the green line there. Uh, we, of course, knew about more poaching incidents during the years where we were doing research and had animals marked, and we had known fates of them. I'm sure there's animals being poached in other years as well, but obviously they're probably not reported to us, so we just don't know about them. Okay, and then uh, other unknown causes, the orange bar would be things like automobile collisions, and then natural again would be things like mountain lions killing mountain lions. Okay. So if we zoom in and just look at the breakdown of the ones taken by hunters, these are the kind of hunting activities that those hunters were engaged in when they harvested a mountain lion. Okay, the blue part are the hound hunters that are going out and specifically looking for mountain lions. The red part of the graph are the other hunters that are out there. They're probably deer hunting, elk hunting, something along those lines, and they just happen to see a mountain lion and the hunting season's open, so they harvest a mountain lion. So there's a lot of that going on. And then there's calling, predator callers that are actually specifically going out there trying to call in a mountain lion using predator calls. There's a lot of people trying to call in mountain lions in North Dakota every year. It's not a very effective method of hunting in North Dakota. You can see not, not very consistently from year to year, mountain lions are going to take by predator callers. OK, so what else did we learn from the carcasses? Some basics, uh, just a little bit on the weights there. Males average 110 pounds, females 82. We have had males as big as 170 pounds. That tops the scales here in North Dakota. Reproduction, they're having two to three, litter, two to three kittens per litter. About 95% of adult females are actively breeding. Okay, and this is all normal. Okay, this is the average litter size for mountains everywhere. They don't really have control over how many litters they, how many kittens they can have. And then typically once they reach an adult age, which in mountain lions is three, okay, females don't breed until they turn three. Uh, they have a pretty high percentage of them breeding at that point in time. Other things we found from looking at mountain lions that come in from hunters is we do have a fair bit of frostbite, uh, missing parts of their ears, parts of their tails. And we do see a fair number of uh, injuries from mountain lions fighting with other mountain lions. Uh, mountain lions missing ears, having scars, missing noses, things like that. And then again, we are seeing that mountain lions are encountering traps. Uh, you can see this white strip of hair along this mountain lion's neck. Uh, that is most likely from being encountering a cable device and the breakaway worked. Okay, the mountain lion got into a cable device, probably set for bobcats or coyotes. It pulled hard enough that breakaway device opened up like it's supposed to and let that mountain lion go, but it left some evidence behind. But one of the most important things we get from the dead mountain lions is their age. Okay, and what we do with the age is we reconstruct the population. So we try and develop a trend line based on that age. How we determine age in mountain lions is by pulling one of their teeth. Okay, the roots of mountain lion teeth have growth rings on them, just like a tree has growth rings. So if you cut a tree off, you can count the growth rings to how old they are. We do that with mountain lion teeth. Actually, all mammal teeth have growth rings. My teeth, your teeth. Uh, but it's pretty common for us to use that as an aging technique for all mammals. And so what we do with that age information is we reconstruct the population trend. Okay, so if a mountain lion was taken by a hunter this year and that mountain lion came back as a three-year-old, we know it was probably in the population as a two-year-old and probably in the population as a one-year-old, and we just keep adding all those individuals up. And in its simplest form, that's what this trend line is developed using. 
the age of those mountain lions, and we reconstruct the population. This has some numbers in it, some statistics, some corrections in there, but essentially one of the things Randy is going to be doing is you notice there's no scale here. Okay? So this is a trend. Is the population going up or down compared to other years? And this trend line is not going to change in trajection, trajectory, but what Randy's going to do is when he validates our population model, he's going to help us scale it. He's going to help tell us how much error this, there is in this line and how much variability there could be. Uh, the trajectory of the line going up and down probably won't change. But as you can see, mountain lions, uh, when we started, were down here, and they slowly went up while we were hunting them. They peaked in probably about 2011, and they've been coming down sen and since. And now we're back down uh, close to where we were when we started about 10 years ago hunting mountain lions. And so that's all the basic information I have for you guys, because that's all we know at this point. Randy's project is uh, slated to wrap up, like Jeb said, in 2017. Uh, so we'll know a little bit more at that time.